Hello, I'm GN42 and I'm going to talk about why Snap is the most important card in the Blue-White Familiars deck. So what I'm going to talk about is what does Snap do? Uses for Snap. Snap is a tempo tool. Snap is mana generation. Snap is mana fixing. Snap versus bottlenecks. The total value from Snap. Snap combos and then some miscellaneous slots at the end. So what does Snap do? Snap is one in the blue for an instant. It says return target creature to its owner's hand. Untap up to two lands. The main uses for Snap or to bounce an opponent's creature for tempo, bounce an opponent's creature to interrupt a combo, like a flicker loop or something, to generate mana, to bounce your own creatures for an ETB, or to bounce your own creatures to save them from, from removal. Generally, you want to combine two or more of these to try to get maximum value out of your snap. The key to understanding snap is that you can almost always find some value for it. And I've seen a lot of fan players will just fire off a snap as soon as they have a target for it, and that's often not what you want to be doing. And knowing when and when not to cast it is a key to understanding familiars. So now I'm going to talk about tempo. With a few exceptions, the opponents aren't playing expensive creatures that are good to snap. The best targets for snap comes down on like turn 2 through 4. The earlier you snap these creatures, the greater amount of total mana advantage you gain, which is tempo. Generating 1 or 2 additional mana on turn 3 is usually much more significant than generating 1 or 2 additional mana on turn 10. So an example of this is snapping a ninja of the deep hours on turn 2, even though maybe you don't get to use the mana off the snap, is effectively a double time walk for 2 mana. So here's an example of this. This is my opponent's turn three. Um, they don't actually have a third land drop. They played a fairy on turn one. I think they maybe spell pierce my thing on turn two. Anyways, on turn three, they're tapping out for a ninja. And I'm going to be able to snap the ninja, untap, cast some spells on my own, and then they're going to have to spend their fourth turn replaying a fairy. And then on, only on their turn five will they be able to replay this ninja, making snap an extremely powerful tempo tool in this particular game. Okay. So here I made a graph in paint of the average tempo advantage gained by using snap on the number of turns. So as you can see, like on, on turn two, as soon as you can play snap, the tempo advantage is insane because if you bounce their two drop, or if you're on the draw and you bounce their three drop, you are basically just gaining free mana, which is like super broken. And then on turn 10 plus, you don't really gain that much tempo advantage. Obviously you're, you're trading cards for mana investment, but it's not quite as strong because the mana investment of one individual creature is not going to be very much. So now I'm going to talk about snap mana production, which is, this is just the quantity of mana. So if you combine snap with Azorius Chancery and Sunscape Familiar, you can generate mana. So the default use case for snap uh, is that you put two mana in and you get two mana back. If you have a familiar or a chancery, you can go plus one mana. So you can either put in a blue and get a blue white, or you can put in a blue white and get um, blue blue white. And this isn't, this um, chart isn't going to consider uh, the colors of mana. So you have a familiar and a bounce land. You can turn your blue mana into two blue and one white mana. And if you have a familiar and two bounce lands, you can turn your blue mana into two white and two blue. And note that the second familiar doesn't actually get you anything um, off of snap, because it only has one colorless mana pit. Floating mana. So oftentimes you're going to want to float mana before you cast snap, because if, you, if it's the first spell you're casting for the turn. Um, but a note about floating mana is that if it's countered, either by counter spell or by removal, you can't unfloat the mana. You want to keep this in mind as you decide whether or not it's worth the float mana before you cast snap. Sometimes the risk or war is not in your favor. A very common case for this is on your upkeep, Ephemerate will rebound, targeting your uh, Arcane Mancer. And if you want to save the Arcane Mancer with a snap, you probably don't want to float mana because if your opponent has another removal spell for the Arcane Mancer, you're going to end up with lands, lands tapped going into your main phase that could have otherwise been untapped. So here's a graph of the average mana advantage gained by snap throughout the game. So on turn two, you're not getting any mana advantage. Um, you're just putting two mana in and getting two mana back. But on turn 10 plus, you're more likely to have uh, more Sunscape Familiars and more Azorius Chancery's in play, which is going to increase the average amount of mana that you're going to gain by using Snap. And like, you're not always going to be able to gain plus three mana off of Snap, but as the game goes on, you're more likely to be able to gain more mana, as you'll just have more resources to work with. So. While it might not seem like a large advantage to produce a few additional mana off snap, it is. When you cast multiple snaps in a single turn, the mana advantage snowballs into something unbeatable. The value of each blue mana and mana in general increases when you have familiars and faithfuls in play. So now I'm going to talk a bit about snap mana fixing. So a very common um, thing that will happen in familiars is against affinity post board, you won't be able to get double white because uh, the deck isn't really set up to support dust to dust on turn three super effectively. But if, for example, your opponent casts a frogmite, what you can do is um, float blue blue white, use the, the double blue to cast snap while white is floating, targeting the frogmite, and then untap your planes in an island to make white white blue required to cast dust to dust. 
And there's other cases where you'll meet, need to make more white or um, set or more blue, um, depending on the the game. Snap versus bottlenecks. So as your resources increase, so do the number of different targets you have for snap. The more possible targets gives you more effective ways to mitigate whatever the bottleneck is at the time. Most commonly, this is either cards or mana, possibly it's life points or other specific cards in the graveyard. Maybe you really need to remove return or remo removal spell that you have in your graveyard, so you can snap an arcane mantle, replay it, and get the removal spell back. Snap can be combined with different cards to give you what you're missing. Most commonly, you used to generate extra blue mana, which is a bottleneck on combo turns when you have one or two familiars in play, because the familiars obviously don't discount your white cards, and so you're your cards end up being, being left with just blue pips, and that's going to be your bottleneck when you have familiars in play. So let's sort of combine the other two graphs um, to get this graph, which is the average total advantage gained by using snap over the number of turns. And snap becomes a card that's both better the more resources you have, the longer you hold it, and the better the less resources your opponent has, the earlier you cast it. Knowing how this curve changes from game to game and match to match will help you get maximum value from snap. So here's a game that I played. Um, I was on the play. And in, in this case, the obvious play is to play the familiar, um, cast a snap, a vocal mold drifter, and then ephemerate it. And you could choose to wait and hope to untap with a familiar and turn snap into a zero mana draw two, but it's much more useful to get the drifter down, ensuring that you don't go to cleanup and then the opponent has no good choice for their removal. Because if they choose to remove the sunscape familiar, then you're still going to get the rebound on the ephemerate and draw two more cards. And if they just choose to remove their mold drifter, you're still going to have the familiar in play and you're going to be able to deploy the cards you just drew for a cheaper. And this is the ultimate endgame for Snap, which is a zero mana draw two. And this is even in the same match as the previous screenshot. And this is sort of like this is just the best case for Snap most of the time, is where you can evoke a Mold Drifter, snap the Mold Drifter, and then untap the lands you use to evoke it and snap the Mold Drifter. If you have two bounce lines, you can even generate additional white mana, but that's not super useful most of the time, so it doesn't really matter. Here's another screenshot of Snap being useful multiple things in the same turn. So I really need to remove the Axe Man Guardian because versus walls, you never want to let them untap that card. And then also I'm going to use the Snap as a draw two with a Mold Drifter so that I can try to dig to a um, an Arcane Mancer. The Snap becomes a card that is both better the longer you hold it and better the earlier you play it. The if, um, longer you hold it has uh, greater mana generation, better value, you know you're missing as far as bottlenecks are concerned, and the earlier you cast it, it gives you a better tempo advantage. Knowing whether you are able to, or must be able to, make it to a point where Snap is at its most powerful is key to playing blue white familiars. For example, sometimes you have to hold Snap in your hand and take a risk because you know that you will need the extra card, card draw to win the game. One thing is that Snap is not just removal. Uh, familiars get the power of having a removal spell be powerful even when the opponent has no creatures that we want to remove. Whereas a deck like Jeskai Ephemerate might have dead cards like Scratter Lightning Bolt uh, in game one if they get paired versus Turbo Fog and Bogles. And even if the opponent has no cards that we the, um, we care about snapping, maybe we're against Bogles or Turbo Fog or we're against Tron or whatever, uh, having a card that you don't have to board out that you can keep in your deck um, post board is extremely powerful because oftentimes uh, like control decks just have a problem for, where they have a bunch of dead removal spells post board and they have too many cards to bring out and not enough cards to bring in. Here's a sort of chart of some common snap combos. There's more than this, but this is just some basic ones. And sort of the, I think the most important one is this top one, the zero mana draw two. Because um, you can pretty easily deploy a familiar and then have enough mana to evoke um, a mold drifter and then immediately snap it. So if your opponent snap taps out, you can just sort of go crazy and turn all the snaps in your hand into zero mana draw twos. And if you have faithfuls out, obviously you gain life, blah, blah, blah. The next two are the two infinite bounce combos. So if you have a Snap, Familiar, Chancery, uh, Flicker, and two Mancers, you can Flicker the two Mancers, return Snap, and then Snap will give you the second blue required to cast the Flicker again. And the same thing is true with the um, with two Familiars and one and no bounce line. And then you can use these these combos above to um, gain infinite life with only one Familiar out if you Snap and replay your own um, copy of God Guards Faithful. This one's a bit more niche, but it has one we, one we matched with before. Talk about ephemerate a bit. So snap converts cards into whatever you're missing, uh, but the card is card negative by itself. But ephemerate plus our answer turns time into cards, and combined with snap can be used to turn time into whatever you're missing. Most commonly, you use this to turn white mana into blue mana. Because blue mana is your bottleneck, you can turn you can ephemerate the arcane answer to return a snap, and then use that snap to generate blue mana on your combo turns when blue mana is your bottleneck. 
as far as boarding out snap, in some cases it's correct to remove some number of snaps from your deck post board because they're only really valuable with a multi and a familiar. Some examples of this are Flecker trying to bogles. Although oftentimes you don't have, like you have, you need to board out all your faithfuls and so, uh, versus Tron, and so you end up keeping the snaps in your deck. Thanks for watching. That's all I have for today.